The next few moments will be devoted to silent prayer. That will give each of you the opportunity to utilize the privacy of your priesthood so that you might name your sins to God. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things which we have forgotten and therefore it is of utmost importance that we utilize 1 John 1 9 which states if we name our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing and that's the grace of God because if you just simply name your sins they are forgiven if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and therefore you will be in fellowship and you will be filled with God the Holy Spirit and that means you are spiritual and you can understand the spiritual things that are about to be taught you can understand the certain sins that we are going to note tonight and therefore with your heads bowed and your eyes closed you have the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God Father, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity this evening to assemble ourselves together to where we can learn the Word of God and learn these things of Scripture. And right now we are studying sin, and may God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to these things, and may God the Holy Spirit give us concentration, because concentration is so important when it comes to to metabolizing these things in the Word. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Now last time we left off with sexual sins, if you remember. And the Bible forbids fornication, and that's what we looked at. This is the uh, listing of sexual sins. The Bible forbids fornication, and that is sex committed by um, unmarried persons. And this is prohibited in 1 Corinthians 6.18. Fornication is prohibited in 1 Corinthians 6.18. And it is also prohibited in 1 Thessalonians 4.3. But in the case of the Corinthians, it was a strong prohibition because the Corinthian church, uh, well, their background was very uh, different from our background because the Corinthian background, they worshipped gods. They worshipped uh, different idols and uh, different gods. And as a sacrifice to the gods, the young ladies would uh, go into the temple and they would offer themselves as prostitutes, yet they were free. They were, it was a free prostitute. And a lot of the men would go in and fornicate with these women. And that was the way that they were making sacrifice to their gods. And this was the background of the Corinthian church. Now those in the church had believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, which means that they were saved, yet they still had that background where they wanted to go back to where they had started from. That, that was their area of weakness, and we have studied that. We have an area of weakness and an area of strength. In the area of strength, the, our area of strength is where we would never think of committing such a sin in our area of strength. But in our area of weakness, if we have a weakness toward fornication, as the Corinthians did, then, of course, uh, this verse would apply to us that we should not uh, fornicate. But uh, we'll get into this in more detail in a little while. Now, uh, the Corinthians, as I was saying... Um, were brought up under fornication. It was part of their lifestyle, so they did it a lot. And therefore, the Apostle Paul taught the Corinthians that fornication is actually a sin. Now, it was shocking for them to hear that, just like it's shocking for us to hear that gossip is a sin. When we hear that gossip is a sin, it's shocking to us oftentimes because in our culture, gossip is accepted. And when I said uh, the last time that uh, if you were looking for social life, then just go to a bar. And then uh, some people looked extremely shocked when I said that. 
And, uh, but that's because uh, they're shocked by different sins. In your area of strength, you would never be a drunk. So in the area of strength, you look very shocked, and therefore you walk out and you never come back again. But in your area of weakness, you can say, um, for example, this was their area of weakness. If your area of weakness was drunkenness, you, well, you wouldn't think nothing about me talking about going to a bar. That would just be part of your lifestyle. And if I were to tell you something about gossip, if that was your area of weakness, you would be shocked to find out that gossip is actually a sin. So there's an area of strength and an area of weakness. And uh, if I ever step on anybody's toes with regard to their area of weakness, for example, uh, they might uh, think that I said something horrible by saying that if you go, uh, that if you're looking for social life, go to a bar. Well, that's where social life is. Do you think the church is designed for social life? Absolutely not. The church is designed where you can get the, the word of God. And that's the way it goes. So therefore... Let's continue. And this is in uh, uh, Corinthians, where 1 Corinthians 6.18, where it uh, says that uh, fornication is forbidden. And um, I don't know any of you, uh, by the way. Uh, well, I do know uh, some of you just by being here. Of course, I know you. But I'm not picking on anybody, and I never want anybody to think that I'm picking on you. I'm not picking on you. I'm just trying to teach doctrine up here, so I don't want anyone to ever get that idea. Uh, I don't want to pick on anybody. I, this message was made two weeks ago. I wrote out this message two weeks ago. Now, I studied it yesterday, and I studied back over it, but I've got messages that go on and on. And in fact, I actually realized that I have a capacity to increase the number of classes and if you're interested in more classes, I'd be glad to come down here and give them because it is a very important. The Word of God is the most important thing in your life. It should be, anyway. And uh, when you learn the Word of God, it gives you something in your soul and you get peace. And from the Word of God, you get happiness, and it's a wonderful thing. So let's continue with the sexual sins. I just described to you fornication, and that took ten minutes. Now let's discuss adultery. And adultery is prohibited. That's found in Exodus 20:14, and it's also found in Deuteronomy 5:18. Those are the two verses. Now I notice some of you like to write notes. Some of you don't. Some of you already know a lot of this stuff, and you don't uh, think you need to write notes. That's fine. It's your prerogative. Uh, but when we get into these things, when we have, some of you have a lot of notes already, but when we get into these things, it might be important to write notes because, especially when I'm teaching salvation, like in the first message I taught that uh, uh, salvation was faith alone in Christ alone. Now in that, if you had your notebooks out, you could write down every verse I had that I was giving you, and you could just write it out. And then you could look at it and memorize it. And then when you come across somebody who's not a believer, it would be very simple for you to refer to those verses. And so it might be important for you to take notes, but if you don't, it's none of my business. I'm just thinking that uh, maybe for your own spiritual growth, when I write, just as an example for me, when I write down notes, I learn more. When I listen, well, that's one way of learning. And then when I write it down, I learn more. And if I go back and look at it, I can uh, learn even more from that. So I think it's important to write down notes, but if all you want to do is listen, that's your prerogative. And uh, you can get many things out of listen because it's hearing the word that matters. If you show up here and you're just listening and you don't want to write notes, well, that's fine. You're still going to get something out of it. Uh, but by way of reference and review, it might be good to do so. So adultery is prohibited in Exodus 20:14 in Deuteronomy 5:18, and then there's mental adultery. Now that's mentioned in Matthew 5:27 through 28, and many people are uh, shocked by the fact that actually mental adultery is <laughs> actually a sin, and yet it is. And Jesus Christ was talking to the Pharisees, the scribes, the hypocrites. Today they would be the uh, the equivalent of the uh, people who always judge you all the time and they judge you for committing real adultery, yet in their mind they have, excuse me, committed 
adultery in their mind, and it's very possible to do so. And that's found in Matthew 27 through 20, uh, 5, 27 through 28. We also noted last time that incest is sex committed between family members. And while this sounds disgusting, and it, and it is, it happens quite often, even among Christians. Christians can commit incest. Now, that might be shocking to you, and you say, how could a Christian do that? Well, a Christian can commit any sin because in the members of our body, we have the old sin nature, and therefore, you can uh, commit this sin even though it is gross. And this is forbidden in Le Leviticus 18, 6 through 17, and it is also uh, prohibited in Leviticus 20, 14, and in Deuteronomy 27, 20. Now the next category is homosexuality and lesbianism. And a lot of people, and I've uh, talked to Catholics who don't believe this is sin. Now uh, the Catholic Church itself recognizes that it's sin, uh, but many Catholics don't, and that's because they don't understand the scripture and they don't know the scripture involved. And there is actually scripture that says homosexuality and lesbian lesbianism are sins. And of course you know what uh, those sins are. And these can be committed by born-again believers. And if you remember back to when I taught 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there was actually a believer there who was having sex with his mother. And uh, so if a believer can do that, he can definitely have sex with someone of the same sex. And that's homosexuality and lesbianism. It can occur between believers, and there's punishment involved with it, as you are a child of God, and if you do these things, there's punishment involved in it. But if you name your sins to God, simply that sin is forgiven. Now, there is a, a move, a great move in this country to have homosexuality legalized, and that seemed to be nipped in the bud in uh, November of last year uh, when people voted overwhelmingly against this type of thing. And there's, some, there's a little bit of hope in that, but you can never put your hope in politicians or in man. So the fact that, uh, and if you ever come across a homosexual, a homosexual person, it is not your place to judge them. And if they're not uh, a believer in Christ, you simply uh, give them the gospel. And what is the gospel? The gospel is the good news. It's not bad news. If somebody comes up to you and uh, they, t they confide in you with their problems and they say to you, well, I'm a homosexual and I can never be accepted by a church that I go to or whatever, you tell them simply, it's faith alone in Christ alone. It is by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And that's what you tell that person who acknowledges to you that they are homosexual. And if they do that, but really your sin should be private. And if in this, if uh, gossip ever starts in this church, you will be kicked out. And I want that to be very clear to all of you. You do not gossip about the people in this congregation because they will feel uncomfortable about coming. And you, you should be able to come here and listen in privacy. We have the privacy of the priesthood. And there are churches up and down the streets that I just came down, Highway 28, Highway 85, all of them. And all they are is a den of iniquity. All they do is gossip about each other. And this church is not going to be about that. Now, I see there are people here tonight when they could be watching uh, television programs or watching something else. But I'm very glad that you're here to listen to the Word of God because the Word of God is extremely important and I need to impart that to all of you, just how important it is. And when you learn the Word of God, you learn how not to be a creep, how not to be a creep in somebody else's life. It's none of your business about somebody else. Your business is with yourself and you have a, I'm spitting, and you have a spiritual life to live. And what you need to do is live your own spiritual life. Don't get your nose involved in everybody else's business. It's not your business. And that's what I'm he here to tell you tonight. 
and my migraine headache went away. Miraculously. <laughs> All right. So now we continue with incest that we noted those verses and homosexuality and lesbianism, and I'll give you those verses. Leviticus 18.22 and Leviticus 20.13. And also, Romans 1, 26 through 27, that's a New Testament verse. It's very important, and it forbids both male homosexuality and female homosexuality, which is called lesbianism. Now, lesbianism, uh, for the first time, is prohibited in Romans 1, 26 through 27. It was prohibited before then, but Paul, the Apostle Paul wrote it down. Usually homosexuality, as listed in Scripture, especially in the Old Testament, dealt with man on man and not woman on woman, uh, but it was a sin in the Old Testament too, just so you know. But it, it mentions it in Romans 1, 26 through 27, that it is a sin uh, for either a man to be with a man or a woman to be with a woman. The precedence was set in the garden. When Adam was in the garden, God created for him a woman. And that is where marriage began. And marriage is a sacred institution. And the destruction of marriage through homosexuality means the destruction of a nation. And I'm glad this nation's not buying into this homosexual movement. And that's because we are a client nation to God. We have a special purpose in this, in this world that we're in to evangelize and also to act as missionaries to other countries. And we have, um, we have failed in many ways, but it seems as if maybe the grace of God will pull us out of this mess. And if more and more people start listening to the Word of God, then we will get pulled out of this mess through blessing by association. And we have not studied this yet, but in fact, if you grow up as a believer in Jesus Christ, your cup will overflow, as it did in David's case. And in David's case, when his cup overflowed, Everybody around him was blessed. And if you grow up to spiritual maturity, everybody around you will be blessed, including your community, your high school, wherever you are, and including even up to your nation, will be blessed by your impact if you grow in grace and in the knowledge of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and this is what you are doing today. And it should be done more around this country. And if nobody else is going to do it, well, I'm going to be right here. And I'm going to do it day after day. And eventually, I plan to have the classes Monday through Friday and twice on Sunday, eventually. Not now. I'm too busy. And I would kill myself if I tried that now. But Tuesday, Thursday, twice on Sunday is fine. And then I might add another even then. But once this gets started, it's gonna, uh, I'm going to add some more to it because the most important thing in your life should be the Word of God. There's nothing more important in your life than the Word of God. What else do you have? A TV show? American Idol? Whatever's on television? That's nothing. You don't get anything out of that. You get entertainment. And you get entertainment from churches today. Americans have so much entertainment, it's, it's amazing. And the fact that you're here with all the entertainment that you have out there, it's amazing to me. I'm glad you're here. And um, I can't believe that you're here with all the entertainment that's going on out there. And you could be doing something that's more fun. Yes, you could. But you're here and you're learning the Word of God. And that is better for your soul. And that's a wonderful thing. And so now uh, we move from homosexuality. The next listing of sin in the Bible for sexual sin is bestiality. And bestiality means that you have sex with animals, and people do this, and it's gross, but people do it, and even believers have done it. And it is sex with animals. And um, the pro prohibition of this is found in Leviticus 18.23, and it's also found in Leviticus 20.15. And do you know what they did in the Old Testament to people who committed bestiality. In the Old Testament, they killed them. If somebody committed bestiality and was caught in the act of doing so, in the Old Testament, there was execution of those people. Now, the Supreme Court of the United States of America just recently did a very stupid and arrogant thing. Now, what happened was the state of Missouri 
uh, decided in a 4 3 de decision in their court that uh, they would overturn what they had later in a 7 0 decision. They said in the 7 0 decision, they said it's okay to execute a juvenile. And then later, the court changed its composition, and in a 4 3 decision, they said that it is not. It is not uh, lawful for you to uh, execute someone under the age of 18. And they reversed their own decision. Well, then the Supreme Court of the United States took up this case, and they took it up for very nefarious reasons, as we find out later. But they took up this case, and um, now the Supreme Court earlier had judged that um, and it was a, um, how many people? Nine. It was nine people on the Supreme Court. Nine to zero, they had judged that it's okay to execute a juvenile per the Constitution of the United States of America. And that's what they ruled in an earlier decision. But when they took up this court decision out of uh, Missouri, they flipped Five of the members flipped their decision, and they said, well, no, it's not lawful because people under 18, they really don't have the sophisticated conscience of people over 18, and that is not true. It was a stupid decision. Uh, you people here who are 14 or under or 13 or 12 or 16, however old you are, you do have a conscience, and you know what it is to murder. And what the, the majority opinion said is that uh, what happened was these guys, they came out and they murdered this woman. And what they did, first of all, for over an hour, they beat her half to death, and her ribs were broken, and the guy said, I'll get away with this because I'm a juvenile. And they drug her up the railroad. There was a railroad, and then there was a, a place where they could throw her into a river. And they threw her into a river alive, and she drowned to death. And the guy said, I'll get away with this because I'm a minor. And the Supreme Court agreed with him. Now that's disgusting. It shows the degeneracy of our land, the apostasy of our land, and the fact that believers in the Lord Jesus Christ have not gotten with the Word of God. Because if believers in the Lord Jesus Christ were learning these things, this stuff would not happen to our country. That somebody could get away with murder like that. It's disgusting. Disgusting, and it makes me sick. But maybe these things will turn around if we get with doctrine. And if we start to grow up spiritually, our nation will continue as a client nation. But if we don't, we will be destroyed by the Lord. He will not put up with this. And what the Supreme Court said, they said, we need to be like other nations. They said, we need to be like Europe, who is kind to those juvenile freaks and thugs who do this. And that's what the Supreme Court said, going by international law. You don't go by international law in the United States of America. That's like the Israelites saying they need a king. They didn't need a king. They needed Bible doctrine. And so what they were doing, we need a king like all the other nations. And what we said is we need to be like all the other. Well, that's what five people of a court did, and that's another issue. Five people in a court don't have the authority from the Constitution or the power to overturn 50 legislatures. We have 50 legislatures in this country from each state. If we have a legislature in South Carolina. They have one in Alaska. They have one in Hawaii. And they make the decisions concerning their state. What this is is a destruction of freedom. And why is it happening? Because believers in the Lord Jesus Christ have not been learning these things that I'm teaching you. That's why it's happening. And it's a terrible thing and a monstrous thing that's happening. But maybe people will wake up and come to realize the, the desperate straits that we're in. Now, I just preached a lot. Okay, let me calm down and go to pimping and prostitution, which is also sin, and that's not a legitimate business, and that's found in Leviticus 19.29 and Deuteronomy 23.17. Rape is also a sin, and that's... Uh, rape is defined as superimposing, superimposing a sex sexual act on somebody who has rejected you. Uh, if you're a young man and you are uh, courting a woman and uh, suddenly you do the dishonorable thing of trying to have sex with that 
girl and she says no and you continue anyway, you have committed rape. And rape is a sin and that is found in Deuteronomy 22, 25 through 27. And what just happened to that speaker is called reverberation. All right. Rape is a sin. Now, some sexual acts, in the, there are some sexual acts we can commit that are not sin. That, well, they are sin, but they are found. They are not found in the Bible, and they're not found in the Bible uh, for various reasons. But necrophilia, what is necrophilia? If you have necrophilia, you are having sexual intercourse with a corpse. That's a dead person. You are having sexual intercourse with a corpse, and that's disgusting in itself, but in fact that was rampant in Europe during the Dark Ages, and that's why they were Dark Ages, and um, they were having sex with these corpus, corpse, thinking that having sex with a corpse would send uh, that corpse to heaven. It was a disgusting religion, and they did that in the Middle Ages, and do you know how long people lived in the Middle Ages? The average age was about 35. And uh, actually, Mozart died at the age of 35, and we all think, wow, Mozart died at 35. He was young. No, that was about the age everybody died then, because it was extremely degenerate. And if we don't turn around, it's going to end up that we're going to start having diseases start showing back up. And uh, in fact, there are some, there's the chicken flu out in Asia. And it could very well spread over the country like it did in the 1920s and wipe out an entire generation. And it did so because that generation cared nothing for doctrine. And if you care nothing for doctrine, God will wipe you out. If you care nothing for the Word of God, God will simply wipe you out. You'll die, and if you're a believer, you'll go to heaven and you'll be happy there. But on earth, you'll be in misery as part of your punishment. And that's what happens to a group of people who do not get with the Word of God. But there might be hope. I hope there's hope. And I hope we can keep going with um, this, and maybe somebody will respond to doctrine. Pederasty. Necrophilia, necrophilia, as I said, is sex with a corpse. Pester, pederasty is not found in the Bible, but that's uh, sexual intercourse between an adult and a child. That is also sin, of course. And voyeurism is not found in the Bible, but that's sexual gratification through watching someone else have sex. And, of course, that's pornography. And pornography is very addictive, and it's, it happens in this country, and it happens to a lot of us. Don't blush. But when you do this, you have First John 1, 9 to rebound it and to get with it and to move away from those things which are not spiritual. It, the things that are spiritual definitely don't deal with pornography and voyeurism and all of those things. Now we move away from sexual sins. That's all I can say about that. And we're moving to emotional sins. Now, in your emotion, you can commit sins, and we'll have a listing of the emotional sins. And it's important to know all of these sins, because if you know these sins, you can avoid them. And if you, can, and if you avoid them and rebound when you do sin, for example, if you have a sin of fear, you can name that sin to God, and therefore you're filled with God the Holy Spirit again. And the longer you are filled with God the Holy Spirit, the longer you live under spirituality, and the more you grow up in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And therefore, you can grow in grace and in knowledge, and you can grow to spiritual maturity and actually have an impact on this country which needs an impact, definitely, especially from young people. Now, I'm going to tell you something. On um, Hannity and Combs tonight at 9 o'clock, that's Fox News. I don't know if you watch it, but on Hannity and Combs tonight, there's going to be a very good example of a vessel of dishonor. Now, I talked to you uh, Tuesday, the vessel of honor and the vessel of dishonor. And the vessel of dishonor was one who did not obey his parents and did not obey authority. And on Hannity and Combs tonight, now I didn't, I haven't got a preview of what's going to happen there, and I don't know what it looks like, but I heard it on the radio. There's going to be a young man there who refuses to stand when uh, the, uh, I believe it's the national anthem is sung, maybe it's America, America, one of those songs, but uh, uh, he refuses to stand, and the fact that he refuses to stand, the teacher gets very irate. He wants him to stand up 
and acknowledge the authority of the United States of America and the fact that he lives as a privileged person in a free country. And this guy cusses the teacher out like he's a nothing. Now, this wouldn't have happened 30 years ago. Stuff like this did not happen 30 years ago, but it happens today because there is a lack of enforcement of authority because parents have gotten to where they say, my little Johnny wouldn't do that, but this is caught on tape. Her little Johnny did do this. And so if you're interested in that, watch on Fox News tonight at 9 o'clock and you will see an example of a vessel of dishonor. And therefore, uh, just take a good look at this person and maybe make some application from what I've been teaching here and the fact that our country is in trouble because if uh, young people like this will not stand for the will not stand when their country is being sung about, there is something wrong in their souls, especially in a country that is so wealthy, so free, and we have so many opportunities here, and they have no appreciation for it. They are people without gratitude, and they are the people that we studied in Timothy the other night. So uh, we're moving on from pimping and rape and then the necrophilia and pederasty and voyeurism, and now we're at the emotional sin. And fear is an emotional sin, and worry and anxiety are emotional sins. If you worry all the time, you're in a state of sin. What you need to do is cast your cares upon the Lord. Uh, And then anger is an emotional sin, and a lot of people don't know that anger is sin, but anger is sin, and it's an emotional sin. Hatred is an emotional sin and an irrational sin. Violence is an emotional sin. And murder, too, is an emotional sin. And so people say, well, he was crazy when he committed murder. Well, he was emotional, very emotional when he committed murder. And therefore, his emotions controlled his soul. And therefore, he was crazy, but he's still culpable. Our society says he's not culpable anymore, but he is culpable. If, uh, for example, if I were to suddenly snap in my head and start shooting people, I hope somebody would put me to death. That's a danger to society. And our thinking uh, today is soft. We've become pretty much now we're doing good over there in Iraq and in Afghanistan. That's because our military is trained to be tough. But over here, the, our civilians have become soft. And that's a problem uh, for us, and therefore we will continue. There are other sin categories, and they include legalism, which we haven't studied yet. There are sins of revenge. There are sins of self-righteousness, sins related to the rejection of authority, and you will see that tonight on Hannity and Combs if you decide to watch it. I don't know which segment it will be. It might be 9.30, 9.15, 9.45. I don't know when they put it on but it'll be between the 9 and 10 hour. And there are sins related to crime, and there are sins of irrationality, and there are sins of mental illness, and there are also chemical sins. And chemical sins means uh, if you take drugs, you're sinning, or if you get drunk, you are sinning. Drunkenness is prohibited by the Bible, and if you're drunk, you're in a state of sin, and that's a chemical sin. And um, let's continue. Now, we have, and now I've, we've went over this a little bit before, but we're going to go over it a little more now, that within us, in the members of our body, we have the sin nature. It's called sark in the Greek. In the Greek, it's called Sparks, and that's what the New Testament was written, mostly in Koine Greek, but there's Homeric Greek, and there are other forms of Greek, and I don't know the Greek language. I know uh, some of the words in it, um, but uh, if I I go to sources, if I don't know what I'm talking about. All right, so let's uh, take a look at the fact, and we looked at this before. I had a circle. I'll make it bigger this time. And I'll try to write better, because I know my handwriting's not good, but I can't help it. That's just the way I was born. So we have an area of weakness. Now over here, in our area of weakness, we have, we will commit a sin, whatever our area of weakness is. That's where our temptation is. And then we have, isn't that ugly, an area of strength. 
Now, in our area of strength, these are sins that we would never commit or sins that we think we would never commit. Every now and then we will. But we see somebody steal something and we say, well, I would never steal a thing. Well, that's your area of strength. But your area of weakness is gossip because you just looked at that person and said, I would never do that, so you're gossiping. And we're about to get to gossip. I don't know if we'll get it tonight, get to it tonight, but we're going to get to the sins of the tongue. And we're going to get to the punishment that, are, that is involved with the sins of the, tongue, of the tongue. And it's worse than the punishment you get for fornication and adultery, which is horrible. Have you ever seen those uh, things in high school when you go through sex ed and they show you all the sexual diseases? That's a horrible thing because uh, you are punished for that and you can uh, get a sex. But it's even more than that. It, it, it messes up your soul. But what messes up your soul worse is gossip, maligning, and judging. And um, these are the, the sins we should be shocked about. So we have an area of weakness and an area of the strength. And I'm going to talk to you about that uh, right now. Now, the area of weakness, this is the source of all temptation to sin. Now, if you're tempted, that doesn't mean you're sinning. Our Lord Jesus Christ was tempted by Satan himself. But that doesn't mean he was sinning. Such thoughts would be blasphemous. Our Lord Jesus Christ never sinned. We could be tempted. That doesn't mean we're sinning. It's only when we accept that temptation that we actually commit sin. So if you're tempted, don't freak out. You're not sinning. You've just been tempted. And that comes from the source of the members of your body, which is the old sin nature, which resides in every single one of us. And for any of us to say we are, without, we are without sin is to say we are very arrogant and therefore you are with a blind sin. And that's even worse than uh, being with sin and knowing when you sin. So there is an area of weakness and that's the source of all temptation to sin. And it is not uh, sinful to be tempted, and, but it is sinful to, to succumb to that temptation. And we have the area of strength. And in the area of strength, this uh, produces. In the area of strength, you can produce human good. You actually do something good for society. Maybe you give to the uh, foundation of, uh, I don't know, any foundation. The Breast Cancer Foundation. You wear pink. Is it pink? Blue? What color? I don't know. But you uh, join the Breast uh, Cancer Foundation and you wear a, a blue br uh, bracelet that you bought for a dollar. Now, don't wear the uh, blue bracelet because that's bringing attention to yourself. And you say, I've given money. If you want to give money to Breast Cancer Foundation, fine. But you don't have to make a scene of it. And that's uh, brought out in Matthew uh, very well. And we will talk about this in Matthew. The fact that when you get, now from your area of strength in the sin nature, you will give to the breast uh Cancer Foundation, and you will wear it, and you will get attention for it, and that's your area of strength in the sin nature, but it's wood, hay, and stubble. It will be burned at the Bema seat. But if you are in fellowship, and you want to give to some good cause, and you say, I give to the Breast Foundation, you don't care about the bracelet, because the bracelet, all that does is bring attention to yourself. What you do with the bracelet is you, you, they'll give you a bracelet, you just throw it in your car, throw it away, whatever you do, but you've given money to that from your own free will. And that's how you give when you, if you ever want to give to a church. When you give to a church, you do it from your own free will. Now, I'm not going to be up here and make smiley faces for everybody who gives and be like, oh, wear this bracelet. You just gave me some money. Thank you. Wear a bracelet. No, that's privacy. I don't need to know if you gave money or not. I don't care, frankly. Uh, I really don't care at all. What I care about is giving you the Word of God. I'll do it free of charge from now till doomsday. I don't care. The Word of God is important to me, and I want to dispense it to others, and it should be important to you. So I don't care about money. Now, pastors might tell you you need to tithe. Well, they're just what they want you to do is uh, uh, to give them, uh, line their pockets with some money. Don't worry about that. You don't have to give anything. Some of us aren't able to give anything, and that's fine. Don't worry about it. What you're, as long as you're here, as long as you're here listening and getting the word of God, I'm pleased.
because that means there's a chance for our country to uh, recover and to continue with its client nation status. And that means there's hope for you to have happiness. And without the Word of God, you cannot have happiness. And so I just noted the area of strength and area of weakness, and we'll get into this more later. But we also have a lust pattern in the sin nature. We have a lust pattern in the sin nature. And lust destroys our motivation for Bible doctrine. And why does it do that? For example, if you have a uh, lust for, well, let's say money. Let's say you have a lust for money. All you want to do your whole life and make a lot of money. So all you're concerned about is money and you think about it all day, acquiring money. Well, where, what time have you spent listening to the Word of God? So that lust interferes with your studying of the Word of God because uh, you're busy lusting about all the money you're going to make and you neglect the Word of God. And there's nothing wrong with making money. There's nothing wrong with starting a business as long as it's not inordinate. And what's that mean? Excessive. If you have an excessive lust to uh, be rich, and that means if you're not rich, you're unhappy, that means you have an excessive lust. But if you have a normal desire to have a business and make a go of it, that's normal. That's capitalism, and that's not sin. But if that interferes with the Word of God, that means that you have moved into something called idolatry. And you say, how can we be, in the United States of America, idolatrous? Because we don't worship a wooden god. We don't worship bronze gods and as they did in the Old Testament. Well, what that means is, um, for example, if you decided tonight that what would be more important than the Word of God would be to watch a TV show. And if you said, what I want to do is go home and watch uh, King of Queens. Is that a TV show? King of Queens. You want to go home and watch King of Queens. And you don't want to come to church because it would be uh, uh, more fun for you, and it probably would be more fun, to watch King of Queens and you'd get a good laugh at it. Well, guess what? If that's more important to you than the Word of God, then you have just made King of Queens your idol. Your idol is a TV and so there are modern day idols. And your modern day idol is whatever you put ahead of the Word of God. Maybe there's uh, some race you want to watch or maybe something else. But if it interferes with the Word of God, then that's become your idol. It's more important to you than Bible doctrine. And you say, well, I can hear it on tape later. Well, that's fine, but sometimes people use that as an excuse. And there's nothing wrong with listening to tapes later. There's nothing wrong with that. And you can get it on tapes later. I grew up spiritually listening to a pastor that I was not face-to-face -face with. I was uh, every now and then. But for most of my life, I did not have the ability to be face-to-face -face with that pastor. And that's fine. And you can grow that way. But if you have a church nearby and you don't show up because of a TV show... Well, that might, uh, for example, if I lived in Houston, I would have been at Baraka every night. Every time the doors were open, I would have been there. My wife can tell you, I would have been. We would have been there every night if I had that chance. But uh, I didn't have that chance, and that's just a matter of privilege. And it doesn't matter, really, if you're facing it. The body, you say, what about Hebrews? You must assemble yourselves together. Well, I'll, we'll get to Hebrews verse by verse, and you'll see exactly what that verse means. That forsaking the assembly. Well, if you assemble before a tape recorder, you're assembling. There is two people there. There is the pastor on the tape, and there's you. And where two or more are gathered together, he is there with you. So you have the tape and the pastor. That's two. And that's what the Bible requires. And you say, but the tape is not the person. Yes, it is. If you uh, followed that logic out to its uh, final conclusion, you would say that uh, the Apostle Paul's letters are not legitimate because he wasn't speaking there. It was a legitimate. It was a letter. It was the Apostle Paul wrote a letter, sent it there, and then somebody read the letter to somebody else, just as a tape would record it to us. So it is. 
So it is actually, and if you ever run across the legalism that you have to be face to face, ignore it. If you want to listen to tapes all your life, you can grow up. I did. I did. And a uh, legalist came up to me and said, well, you need to go to a church. You need to be face to face. Well, there were none around me, my goodness. Now, all they taught, all they taught was uh, st- uh, superficiality and stupidity. I didn't want to go to a, uh, a church around there. There was no doctrinal church, no place that taught the Word of God where I grew up. What I wanted to do was learn the Word of God, and I did it on tape. Now, when I was 14, 15 years old, I couldn't get on a plane every night and fly from Spartanburg to Houston. That would be insane, and that's not how God designed it. Now, if if I had been in Houston, I can tell you I would have been at Barack every night. But the fact is, I had to do it at home. And if, uh, you have to do it at home because there's no doctrinal teacher in your geographical area. Well, then... That's fine. Don't get sucked into the notion that you need to be face-to-face. Now, face-to-face is very nice. When I was face-to-face, I enjoyed it a lot. But you know what happened to me every time I got face-to-face? You see, the colonel was my pastor. And when I went to see him face-to-face in Florida, Pensacola, Florida, he had a very nice, he didn't have hair, he had a very nice, very shiny head right here and it just it just glowed with radiance and this doesn't mean anything but I'm just telling you and while he was preaching my eyes got focused on the fact that his head right in here was glowing with radiance and I looked at him and then I started glaring at him because and well he wasn't pleased by that and and what happened was that day the power went out so his speaker went out so he brought in all the chairs, and I was up front. I loved to be up front. I wanted to hear everything. And so he brought the chairs right up here. He was spitting on my face while he was teaching. And he brought it right up here. And I was just glaring at that head. And man, that's, that, that head just glowed. That's what I was thinking. And then all of a sudden, I didn't know he was going to do this. He wasn't even looking at me. He was just looking away, doing, but, you know, you have peripheral vision. When I look down a lot, and I do, and I'm trying to change that to where I'll just look at you more, but I can still see you when I'm doing this. I know what you're doing. I know when you're not listening. Uh, But uh, that's what he did. He looked down. He saw me glaring at his head, and he looked down. He knew what he was going to do. And then I'm sitting right there, about where Zach is sitting, right here. And he just went, I mean, I don't even know what he was saying, but he was just yelling at me straight in right there because he thought I was rejecting what he was saying because I was glaring. And that would be a normal uh, thing to assume. But I wasn't, and I wasn't about to say, man, I'm just looking at your bald head. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that wasn't. But uh, I didn't reject him because I got chewed out. So I was like, well, he's teaching the word. And uh, maybe, I, and I did get to where I wasn't really listening to him. And Well, I was just amazed by his head, so I was not really listening. And he chewed me out, and that's fine. Yeah, I've come back Latin. I deserved it. So what? So what if you get chewed out? Don't take it personal. It's not a personal thing. It's just uh, if you get chewed out, it's just uh, well, maybe I was wrong. That's what. I, that's the way I looked at it. Now it's hurt for a little while, but I got over it, and I went back to listening. And uh, the, the same day, actually, and then my dad. I won't tell you what my dad said, <laughs> but it was funny, and. Uh, I can't tell you what he said. Let me put it to you that way. All right. So we're continuing here with um, where where do we went through the area of weakness and the area of strength <coughs> and the trends and the lust pattern and the fact that if you have monetary lust, for example, was the example I gave was monetary lust. And um, we have two different lust patterns. Now, all of us have two different lust patterns, and a lot of this has to do with our upbringing. And uh, I don't know how much of it has to do with genetics, but I think a lot of it has to do with our upbringing. For example, if we're brought up under a a church that uh, frowns on people and gossip and maligns people all the time, then uh, what trend you're going to have, there's a trend over here, and that's called... (coughs) legalism and then over here 
Over here, the people that want to raise hell, go out to bars, get drunk, and that's called antinomianism. Antinomianism, that's a, that's a pretty big word. And legalism on this side, they judge and malign people all the time. And antinomianism, well, they like to go out and have fun, meet a friend, fornicate, and that's, but they're both sin. And in fact, this area over here is harder to overcome because it is blinding, as that light is. It's blinding. And it blinds you to the fact that you are a sinner. You have a double standard when you're in this area over here. You have a double standard when it comes to the Word of God. And I'm going to go on and uh, skip to the double standard. I had some other things, but the, the time is... I've only been through a little bit, and, and it's almost time to quit, but I don't want to. So we have the double standard related to the sins of the tongue, and the sins of the tongue are committed by people on this side. They're legalists, and all they do all day is they say, I wouldn't do that, look what this person did, blah, 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 blah. And that's the legalistic side. And so you have double standards, and that's found in Psalms 12.2. And if you want to turn to that, that's perfectly fine. Psalms 12.2. And here it says, they speak emptiness one to another with flattering lips, and with a double standard they speak. They speak emptiness one to another with flattering lips, and with a double standard they speak. And that double standard is, uh, how can I explain the double standard? I'll explain it this way. Uh, First of all, when they see you going out, uh, well, let's give an example. You go out to a bar, you get uh, a little toasted, and then you meet a, a lady, or if you're a woman, you meet a man, and you take them home, and then you fornicate. That is anti, it is sin. I don't want you to misunderstand, that is sin. And you will be punished for it. And they go out and do that. Well, these people, under this trend of the sin nature, will say, look at that person doing that. Well, they can't even be a Christian. Yes, they can. What is a Christian? If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are saved. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Um, well, uh, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So our salvation is a gift, whether we're under this or under this. It doesn't matter. If you, if you believe in Christ and gossip about somebody, you're saved. And if you believe in Christ <coughs> and you go out and fornicate, you're still saved. That's the grace of God, as Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says, as I just quoted to you. So the legalist the, in, in legalism uh, says to this person, you are a sinner. And they are judging. And you should not judge. That's in the Bible. Do not judge. So they're sinning too. Both are sinning. They're just polarized sins. And then up above it all, we have, uh, way up here, up above it all, you can live the spiritual life. And there you are filled with God the Holy Spirit. And when you're filled with God the Holy Spirit in the spiritual life, thus, whatever that is, in the spiritual life, then up here, you're above all of this back and forth bickering and gossip. And this is what churches come to because they don't understand the Word of God. They, don't, they, don't, they haven't looked into it. They don't want to study about it. They, they don't want to know what sin is all about. And if they did, they would see that there are two categories of sin. Fornication is a sin. Judging is a sin. You judge the fornicator, both of you are sinning and you are out of the spiritual life. Now, if uh, you rebound, if you're in antinomianism and you go out and commit fornication and say, Father, as per 1 John 1, 9, which says if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. If after we fornicate, we say, Father, I have committed fornication. 
as per 1 John 1, 9. Then you immediately move back into the spiritual life. And this person over here still gossips about you, but you're in the spiritual life. And we'll get to this more because there's punishment, severe punishment. Which, which one receives the most punishment? We will see probably on Sunday. I might not get to it tonight, but this side over here receives triple compound discipline. And why? Because they judge. And when they judge, if they say, okay, a uh, person over here, they say, you have committed fornication. Guess what God does in that? Well, what is that person doing? They're acting as our Lord Jesus Christ. They're in blasphemy. They're acting as our Lord. They have no right, no right whatsoever to judge the person over here. Now, the person over here doesn't have that weakness, so they don't judge. And the person here is blind. And I'm sorry if you're bored, but these are important things, and we'll get to them later. So there is a double standard relating to the sins of the tongue. And they speak emptiness one to another with flattering lips. And remember how Satan flattered Eve. That's how Satan did it. And what do the religious people do? Now, religion is the devil's ace trump. That means, uh, what does religion say? Religion says that uh, you can get to know God by all of your works. You could work yourself into heaven. That's what religion says. What does Christianity say? Christianity says, says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. <coughs> Christ was the one that did all the work. Why are you working? Why are, why are you insulting our Lord? He did the work, did he not? And if he did the work, what do we have left to do except to believe, which is non-meritorious. That means it takes no effort to believe. We believed one plus one equaled two. It takes no effort to believe that one plus one equals two. It takes no effort to believe the very vocabulary we speak. And it takes no effort to believe in Jesus Christ. But what it, what it does take is humility. When we believe in Christ, we are saying to ourselves, we have nothing left that we can do to, be with, to, be, to have a relationship with God. We are saying we have nothing left to do to have a relationship with God. And therefore we say in our humility at that point, I believe in Christ. And that's a humble statement when you do that and you are saved. And people who have believed in Christ will commit fornication. They will. They will commit adultery. They will go out and get drunk. People who have believed in Christ do this. They do. We all sin. 1 John 1, 8 and 1 John 1, 10 makes this very clear. And on this side, people who believe in Christ will gossip. They will malign and they will judge. Now, the problem with this side is they don't know they're sinning. They say they gossip about somebody all day. They don't know they're in sin, but they're in the worst category of sin. There's punishment that's going to come to them. Severe punishment. We're going to find this in James. And this will come up Sunday night. Now it's getting past 8 o'clock and we probably have some television we want to watch or something else. I could stand up here for three more hours, but then I wouldn't wake up for work tomorrow. So what I need to do is cut this off and uh, I'll let you go. And uh, we'll see you Sunday morning at, what time do we meet? 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock Sunday morning. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege this evening to study your word. We realize that in some countries around the world they do not have this privilege, but we have the privilege under freedom in this country to study your word. And may we come to understand better the knowledge of our sins. Let us come to understand sin. Let us come to understand that gossip is sin. Let us come, come to understand that maligning is sin. And those sins that we do know are sins, and most of us know fornication and all those other uh, overt sins. We all know the overt sins simply because they're overt. And we know these sins, and let us understand that when we commit such sins, uh, whether it be the sin of uh, uh, gossip or the sin of fornication or adultery, 
let us understand that the solution to sin is always the same, and that is your grace provision of First John 1 9. For if we name our sins, he is faithful. And what does faith will mean? That means that he will do it every time. No matter how many times we sin, God is faithful. And that is as a result of our Lord's uh, the, uh, the judgment on the cross. He was judged on the cross. Therefore, we can name our sins simply to him, no matter what they are. And help us to understand this more. And help us to have God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and act as a concentration for us because what is important when we learn the Word of God is a concentration. And may this be imparted to us by God the Holy Spirit. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.